Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Hope you guys had a great Memorial Day weekend. It was beautiful weather. I enjoyed myself. You guys good today? Is God good today? I'm going to step into a big hole of theology today. Uh, last week we got some great feedback that you guys liked the panel, you liked the discussion format, so moving forward we will put more of that into our preaching calendar. But I was kind of talking on a, a, a why pastors are hitting on hot topics or anything like that, and so we are going to talk about reconstructing our faith, and we are going to look at an, a concept, something that I deconstructed and reconstructed in my life, and it is a hot topic. It's one of those that I need you to have an open mind as we begin to talk, because I'm going to come out of the gate blasting, and as I blast, you're going to be offended. Uh, if you've been raised in church, if you have any religious background, you're, think, you're going to think that I'm going to hell, that I'm a heretic, that, you know, that I'm going to get struck by lightning. So before we do that, I'd like to pray. <laughs> I'd like to pray for God's protection as I step into that realm. But the idea behind deconstruction is that it's a buzzword in society. People are deconstructing everything. They're deconstructing the way they were raised. And do I think the same way that my parents think? Do I believe in marriage? Do I believe in the constructs of organized religion? And we're deconstructing all these things. But if we do not reconstruct the things that we deconstruct on a biblical foundation, it's part of a demonic scheme that will bring you to deconversion, okay? You must reconstruct your faith in the things that you believe based upon the word of God. In Jeremiah 1, 9, and 10, it says this, then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So we can build and plant, we can grow and we can create, but there's also some things that we need to look at maybe removing from our lives that are not beneficial to our lives in order to have a healthier walk and healthier view of our Christian faith. So let's go ahead and pray for that protection over me. Father, we thank you today as we get into your word that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, help us to look at scripture maybe a little bit differently today, challenge ourselves to think outside the box. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys ready for it? What if I told you today that God is not in control? I told you. I told you. Quiet. He's going straight to hell. Oh, my God. Maybe you were raised with the same buzzword, the same sentence. God is still on the throne. God is in control. Simple sentence, but perplexing. Is God in control of everything? Well, to say that God is in control means that he's in control. So, like, my question is, was God in control of what you ate from dinner last night? I mean, let me just say, let's look at it. Well, God's in control. Okay, so when your wife said to you as a husband, hey, what would you like for dinner tonight? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? Let's pray about it. <laughs> Almighty God, creator of heavens and the earth and sea and everything in it, what do I want for dinner tonight? Impress it upon my spirit and lead me into all truth as to what dietary restrictions I should follow. We cast out and cast down any calories that may make us overweight and obese. Remove diabetes from my diet. Did you do that? So was, is God in control of your meal plan and your meal prep? Was God in control whether you hit snooze on your alarm clock this morning or not. Okay, so when we use terminology and we use statements, well, God is just in control. God is in control. The implications are that God is in control of every single thing that happens in the entire world. 
And I can't accept that. I can't accept that because bad things happen. And God cannot be the author of evil. He cannot be the God of bad things. He cannot be the God of evil works. He cannot tempt with evil, nor can he be tempted with evil. God is good all the time. God is love all the time. Anything outside of those two factors, anything outside of good and perfect, anything outside of love is not God. Yet, it's easier for us to blame everything on God than to have a logical, biblical foundation for what we actually believe. I told you we were going there. God cannot sin. So, So there's this belief. There's this belief that says, well, God is in control of everything, so no matter what you do or what you did, that was God's will, and you did what God planned for you to do. Well, I did something bad yesterday. I said a bad word yesterday. Was God in control of me saying that bad word? Because God cannot lead me into sin. I mean, it's literally in the Lord's prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So did God make me say a bad word yesterday? No, because God cannot sin, nor can he lead you to sin. God, okay, I know you love me, right? You know I'm going to get somewhere, right? You trust me enough to get there? Okay, God's not in control, but God is in charge. God is not in control, but God is in charge. And there's a difference. There's a difference. Between services, someone asked me, well, Pastor Mike, if God is all-knowing, he knows the beginning and the end. He knows everything that you're going to do throughout your life. Every single decision you're going to make. Is that true? Yes. Then essentially, isn't he in control? No. No. (laughs) just because he has knowledge doesn't mean he has involvement. Any golfers in the house? I am recently obsessed with golf. I have golfed almost every day this week just because that's how I do when I get involved in something. I'm, I'm loving it, right? I can look at somebody, they get up to the tee box, and I say, hey, you're going to slice that ball. They're like, no, I'm not. I'm aimed in the right direction. Based on your setup, I have knowledge. I'm just saying, you're going to hit that ball over there. So whatever. They get up there. No, I'm not. You know what you're talking about. Bow. In the woods. Five dollars. Gone. Now, did I make them hit that ball in the woods? Who was in control of hitting that ball in the woods? Although I had knowledge, I told them, the way you're lined up, the way you're standing, that ball is going to go there. But they still were in control of hitting that shot. I have a 20-year-old daughter. I have an 18-year-old daughter. I have a 10-year-old son. We have this family law that on your 16th birthday, you have to get your permit. So on your license, your renewal date is your birth date. It's just like a family tradition thing. So my kids have been driving for some time. My oldest has been driving for four years. My uh, middle child's been driving for two years. And, you know, we wanted them to take driver's ed so they could have their, don't have to have the junior license, but they could have their, you know, full license and all that. And there came to a point where I bought them a car, and I handed them the keys. I gave them those keys. I empowered them to drive that car. Now, up to that point, they were only empowered to drive with me in the passenger seat. And throughout that time, if they started to kind of go over the yellow line, I'd reach up, I'd grab the wheel and bring it back. I'd tell them, hey, hey, slow down. Hey, that's a, that's a yellow light, slow down. I gave them this instruction, I was involved. But there came a time where I gave them the keys. And I said, go. I trust that I have trained you and taught you 
and given you enough knowledge to drive that car and enjoy it, please do not text and drive. Please avoid the amount of distractions that you have in your vehicle. And do not have anybody in your vehicle who has an illegal substance with them or bring an illegal substance in your car because then it's daddy's again. Right? Once they start, I gave them those keys and they go, they are in control of driving that car. I'm no longer in the passenger seat grabbing the wheel and moving the car. But I'm in charge because that car's mine. You get a ticket, thank you for those keys back. You lost your car. Come on, somebody. I'm in charge. I pay the insurance. I pay the payment on that car. I'm in charge. I make the rules. God is in charge. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is sovereign. God is in charge. But he's entrusted you to make sound decisions in this life. I began to deconstruct the concept of God being in control 16 years ago. 16 years ago, I was confronted with this theology that God was in control and something that had happened to me, you know, must have been God's will. And I said, this can't be. If, if this is, if God is in control like everyone says he is, I'm out. I'm out. I'm no longer a Christian. I no longer believe this faith. It was this detrimental. 16 years ago, we lost our third child. It was late in the pregnancy. We were going in for our second sonogram. Really excited about it. I had my four-year-old on one leg. I had my two-year-old on the other leg. We're all in the room for this moment. And I tell my girls, this is like the most exciting part. The doctor's going to put this little thing over the heart, and we're going to hear, shoo, 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 shoo. That's what it sounds like. And so the technician's drawing a line here and a line here and a measurement here and a circle here and all these things. And like, Daddy, where's the shoo, shoo sound? It's coming. Daddy, where's the shoo, shoo sound? It's coming. She's not there yet. And it's just not dawning on me that there's a problem or there's a situation until the technician picks her head up and she has tears running down her face. She leans over and whispers something in my wife's ear, which creates a, a face on her that I'll never forget. And I kind of scooped the girls up and walked out of the room with them. We had already announced to the church that we were going to have a child. It was in the bulletin. We used to print out these newsletter sorts of things and give them out to the church every week. It was in the bulletin. We were expecting a baby. I had the room painted. I had things picked out. This was baby Mikey, Mikey Jr. I had it planned out. It was all set. and My heart's broke. Heartbroken, like literally devastated. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. So we go to church, and obviously people are seeing that things aren't progressing and that my wife's stomach isn't getting any bigger. They begin to ask questions about the pregnancy, and we tell them what happened. And well-intended Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord, said the most stupidest, idiotic, unintelligent, hurtful things I could ever imagine, trying to console me. Well, you know, Mike, God is in control. He's got to trust him. So God decided for me that my child should die. Well, that, well that, that's not really what I meant when I said God's in control. I'm saying, <laughs> what? what? What are you saying? Well, you know, Mike, maybe it's just not God's will that you have a son. What do, you, what do you mean? I dreamed of having a son since I was a kid. What do you, God decided. God chose for me that I shouldn't have a son. 
Are you kidding? Really? I was done. This can't be true. This can't be true. Well, maybe there's just a lesson that God's trying to teach you. I'm trying to compose myself as to not get angry about that statement. Because I didn't learn nothing. I didn't learn, I didn't learn anything about a good God in a situation like that. Would you take your child's hand and put it on a hot frying pan to teach your kid not to touch hot things? If you would, you're an abuser. A good God doesn't do that. I, I told you, I told you it's gonna be a tough one, right? Because we've been taught maybe one thing our whole lives. And all we have to do is just ask a few questions. What is God's involvement? What has God predecided? What is God in charge of and what are we in control of? And I cannot believe, I can't accept, even to this day, there's nothing you can tell me, that God determined that my child should die. No way. I can't believe that. I can't accept it because God is good. God is good all the time. What I can accept is this. My body is imperfect because of the fall of humanity. My body has sin in it. And my body created a being that could not sustain life in the womb or outside of the womb. I can accept that. I can accept that the devil, the Bible says, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I can believe that the enemy uh, has come into this world to steal, kill, and destroy. But I also believe that Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. <laughs> Tough situation. Tough topic. I had to deconstruct this so that I could reconstruct a belief system based upon the word of God that I can live in my relationship with him. The concept of God being in control, if you care to know where it comes from, God being in control comes from a belief system or a theology called predestination. Predestination. And literally the word is God foreordained or God predecided, predetermined, predestination, predetermined. So the question is, how far do we take the concept of predestination? Because it is in Scripture. We can't throw this away. We can't take this word out and say it doesn't exist. It is here. But to what extent is it here? Um, in the Calvinistic, Cal Calvin belief system, Calvinism, they believe that predestination is about everything. God has predetermined and predecided everything that applies to your life. So God decided what you were going to eat for dinner last night. But no, he didn't. I just was in the mood for pizza. Well, no, God knew that you were going to be in the mood for pizza. Therefore, God predetermined that you would have pizza last night. That, that's how far predestination goes. That anything that you think you decided, God had already decided it for you. Therefore, it's happened. But like, then where's free will? Then this whole concept is just kind of dumb then. Like, God predecided for Adam that Adam was going to eat of the apple. But that goes back to my golf situation. Just because God knows something doesn't mean that God is involved with it happening. Doesn't mean that he's causation of it happening just because he has knowledge of it happening. You gotta grasp that concept. If you don't grasp that concept, you're gonna fall into, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter to me whether you're Calvinistic or not. I, I happen to lean that way as far as the Bible, solo scriptura. I believe that the Bible should be the basis for every decision that we make, but I do not lean towards predestination. I, I, I do not go that way. I believe that God has given us authority and power to rule and reign in this life. Yeah. 
But where does the idea of predestination come from? I'm just going to give you one verse. There's like five or six. Ephesians 1.11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, there it is, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So right there, that's like one of the main ones. Look at this. God is working everything to his will. He's working all things to what he wants to happen, and you have no say in the matter, okay? So we've got to do proper Bible interpretation. We've got to go back and look at this. In him, in God, also we have obtained an inheritance. So in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. We got that? Okay. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things. So what has been predetermined? The inheritance, obtaining the inheritance. So we need to go back and look at the context for what this is talking about. So you can't just take that verse out of context and say, look, guys, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined and God's going to do whatever he wants. Okay? So if you leave that by itself, you could make that say that. Okay? So we need to back up a few verses. Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. This is verse 11. 7 through 9. In him, we have redemption through his blood. So in Christ, we've been redeemed. We've been bought back. We've been paid with a price. So has anybody ever taken bottles back to the store? They call it redeem this for five cents, right? So we've been redeemed. We've been bought back by the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us all in wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, his will is good, which he purposed in himself. Which was what? Which was what? Think about it for a second. What did God predetermine? Salvation. He predetermined salvation, and not who would be saved and who would not be saved. Come on, come on, follow me. Follow me, hold on, follow me, follow me, follow me. God foreknew everything that's going to happen. God foreknew what Adam was going to do. Therefore, he created a plan. He didn't make Adam eat the apple, but he knew Adam was going to eat the apple. Because he knew Adam would eat the apple, he created a plan. He predetermined a plan that he would send himself, he would send his son into the earth to pay the price, to be the payment of sin that we might have an inheritance, that we might have salvation. He predetermined that Jesus Christ would be the payment that we could have eternal life. God doesn't care if you eat Dunkin' Donuts. He does, but he doesn't. Like, he, he does. Like, if you have diabetes, he does, but he doesn't. Right? God's not micromanaging every situation. God doesn't really care what kind of car you buy. But if you invite him into the decision-making process, he might have some wisdom for you. Lord, lead me to a great deal. Lead me to a car that's on sale. Lead me to talk to Brett right here, Mitsubishi, Middletown. Check me out. Lord, don't let me get no lemon. I don't want the headache. I don't want to go through all that. Right? Come on. Like, we can invite God into areas of our lives, but he's not going to step in and take over. One, that's not a gentleman, and two, that's not a God that gave you free will. Listen, I know, I know this is going to rock theology, but this series is written in what's called the evangelistic voice. This series was actually targeting people who are non-believers. People who say, I could not go to church because I cannot believe in a God that does bad, thing to good, bad things to good people. And I promise you, God doesn't. God doesn't do bad things. The devil does bad things. 
and you choose to do bad things. We just want to blame somebody. And with our lack of intelligence and our lack of theology, must be God. Must be God. If God is so good and God is so powerful, then why are all these bad things happening in the world? Because he's not the God of this world. He's the God of the believers who accept him as their sa his savior, as their savior. Watch. Let's take a look at this. Man, I'm jumping all around. I'm sorry, guys. They're like trying to figure out my notes in the back. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In, the case, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There is a Satan in this world who's the God of this world's system, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He does not want you to be successful. He does not want you to find the truth. He does not want you to find God. He wants to keep you where he's at. I got one more illustration for you today. If they put camera one up on the screen and camera one is just, what's wrong with this shot? Anybody tell me what's wrong with this shot? Why is it blurry? It's out of focus. It's out of focus. Is anyone sitting in these seats in control of focusing that camera? No. Who's in control of focusing that camera? Okay, but what about the command room upstairs? What about them? What about the switchboard upstairs? Camera one, check your focus. Camera one, check your focus. Camera one, you're out of focus. So command room could be all day up there. You're out of focus. Zoom in, zoom out, pan left, pan right, tilt, up, down. You're out of focus. They're the command center. They're in charge. They're calling the shots. They're telling what's best for everybody. They're saying what's best for your life, what's best for you to move forward. But if that camera operator doesn't turn the dial, if that camera operator is distracted by life, by noise, by looking on their cell phone when they should be focusing the camera, then they're going to live a life out of focus. They're going to live a life that's blurred. are going to live a life that we don't know if we're nearsighted or farsighted, but we're just out of focus because we're not listening to the one who's in charge. But yet we want to lay back and say, well, you know what? It's not working out because God's in control. He says, but I gave you control. No, you take control. But I gave you control. No, you take control. But I gave you control. No, you take control. Have you ever gotten to the argument of what to watch on Netflix? And you throw the remote to each other? No, you figure it out. 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 I feel like that's with God all the time. God, whatever your will is, but whatever your will is. And whatever your will is, whatever your will is. Whatever your will is, but whatever your will is. He says, my will is that that may prosper and live in health, even as your soul prospers. My will is that with a long life, I will satisfy thee. My will is that the joy of the Lord is your strength and that a happy heart does good like a medicine. My will is that you love one another and do good to each other, that you would meet in the house of the Lord and worship together. But God, what's your will though? But, but what's your will? There was this group of people in the Bible who had like this really awesome relationship with God. Like, they were God's people. They were called the Israelites. And he would move among his people, and he would speak to his people. And one day they're like, you know, God, it's like, this is a lot. It's like a lot that you talk to us. And like, you want us to do stuff. Like, could you stop that? Could you like stop talking to me? Just talk to Moses. And just tell him what to tell us. And we, we can live according to any laws you give us. Like, we're good. Like, we're really good people. We'll do whatever you say to do. Just write it all down. And God's like, 
<laughs> what? You don't, have a, you don't want to have a relationship with me? You don't want me to be involved in your life? Like, I'm talking to, yeah, yeah, it's just too much. Like, it's a lot. Just like, talk to Moses. And God said, okay. All right, you think you're good enough? You think you're good enough to follow a set of laws? Now, there ends up being like 360-something laws, but he said, I'm just going to give you 10. And you can't even do 10. Right? And the moment you break it, you're dead. Like, here's the first rule. Don't touch the mountain. Very first rule. Don't step foot on that mountain. The day he gave the law, 4,000 people were like, yeah, right. Dead. Dead. Day one, gave the law. 4,000 dead. But I love, I love how he renews the times. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, the Spirit falls upon the 120, they walk out into the streets and they begin to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. 4,000 people give their lives to Jesus on the day of Pentecost. 4,000 died at the law, 4,000 brought to life the day the Holy Spirit came to the earth. God is in charge. He will always be in charge. But he's waiting for you to move. He's back in your play. Listen, listen. He says, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. I, I'll back your play. I gave you authority. I give you power. Yeah, but we don't want it. Like, just tell Pastor Mike what to tell us. I don't want to have to read my Bible, pray. Like, God. But you're in control. You're in control because I don't want to do nothing. And that's where Christianity's come. Not that you believe he's in control. But you don't know anything else. We we don't have any other idea of what like a healthy prayer life would look like. He says, if you speak to the mountain, it will be removed and cast into the sea. Like he gave you authority to talk to sickness and disease to be removed from your life. He says that we are to operate and walk in faith, but it's easier to say, well, it is God's in control. Whatever happens, God must want it to happen. But he's calling you. He says, but just focus a little bit. Just just zoom in on this area right here. Zoom in right here on this area of your life. And man, I will make something happen that you couldn't even have room enough to receive it all. No, you focus the camera. You focus my life. He says, bro, I sent my son to die on a cross. I made the first move. I made the first move. I showed you my love that while you were yet sinners, I sent my son to die on the cross for you. I moved before you even knew of me. I moved before you were even created. I need you to move. I need you to act. I need you to put your hand to the plow. So although, and listen, here's, here's, here's my next level of disclaimer. You don't have to agree with me today. It's okay. Like, we can still be friends if you don't believe this way. If you believe that God is in control of every single thing, that's totally cool. But I'm just telling you, for me, I had to work on that. I had to deconstruct it and reconstruct it to what is God's part to play in my life and what's my part to play? And what's the enemy doing? Like, I had to figure these three things out for myself, and I would hope. I would hope that if you disagree with me, or even if you agree with me now, oh man, Pastor Mike said it, so it must be true. Don't do that. Don't do that. You owe it to yourself to study this out. You owe it to yourself to look up what those scriptures mean. And if you do want to debate with me, that's totally cool. But don't send me someone's YouTube video of them preaching. That's not your revelation. Right? Don't, don't make me argue against another preacher. Like, <laughs> Come on, that's not what we did here. Don't go Google something and send me a link that you didn't do any research on, you just Googled it. No, no, no. Let's have an actual conversation as to what you studied in Scripture. 
Because this is what we're called to do, right? God said, go, man, rule and reign in this life. Don't just sit back and think someone's doing all the work for you. I did the work of the cross. I did the work of Calvary. I did the hefty lifting of your salvation. The rest, here you go. Here you go, right? With my kids. I bought the car, but doggone, just wash it. Vacuum it out. Keep it clean. You back over something, go get it fixed. Get the oil change. I did the heavy lifting. I bought the car. Maintain it. Keep it. Watch it. God created the entire earth. He said, Adam, keep it. Protect it. Care for it. It's yours. Rule and reign in this life. But you got to invite him into it. You got to invite God into your life. You got to invite him in to say, God, although you've given me control, I want you to be in charge and I want to follow your lead. Lead me, guide me, direct me. And he will. He will. But you got to invite him into that. And the biggest invitation that you could ever give is to invite him to be your Lord, invite him to be your Savior. If you're in the room today or watching online, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You've never accepted him into your life to be your savior. The Bible says this, that with the heart man believes, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we do that by praying a prayer. It's called the prayer of salvation. If you've never done that before, or you're watching online, you've never done it before, we'd love to lead you in this prayer together that goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.